Hey everyone, this is a video about rings. Yeah, uh, I get asked sometimes, uh, one of these days I'll put it in the Q&A officially, they say, hey Dave, you know, what is the ring? I've seen you opening like beer bottles and stuff with it. Uh, what is that something like a crazy device? No, it's not. Uh, it doesn't have a little ring thing attachment. It's just a tungsten. My wedding band is tungsten. And then people say, oh, it's like matchy matchy. You got a black, you know, what is this other ring? Is it like a poly thing or something? Uh, no, no, there is a fun story about that uh, and the origins of it. But no, this is a, what's called an aura ring. I might do a video about it another day. It is something that monitors my sleep and my heart rate and all kind of other functions. So I can send my uh, personal health data to, you know, company over in Scandawegia or something. However, sometimes when you see me, I'm not wearing my regular rings. Sometimes I'm wearing these rings. Yeah, they look similar, don't they? But they're not. Uh, these are RFID rings. In fact, one of them uh, is the result of a question that a person asked me, and that's going to be what we talk about in this video today, the function and feature set on this dual technology ring. Hey everyone, yes, hello. This is a video about rings. Uh, not the ones I'm usually wearing, but the rings that I have in this little box here. These are both RFID enabled rings. They are kind of a, an outgrowth of that talk that I gave about biohacking and implantable RFID at B-Sides Raleigh. Love all the feedback from that, the Dangerous Things forums, a lot of biohacker forums, the Future Flesh, Biohackers Digital. I'm loving all the Discord chatter. But some people reached out to me and a couple folks said, hey, you know, I'm not ready to like take a needle jab in the hand, but you mentioned wearables like, like rings in these. Could I try these out? Are these good? Are these bad ones? There are some Amazon links that people threw at me. I'll, I'll link all this stuff below. Again, none of this is sponsored. But one person, they actually bought this really cool dual technology ring. And they said, hey, look at this thing. You said like, it's the magic my fair and it's a T55. That's like, that's like your thing. That's like your jam, right? I'm like, yeah, I, I do recommend those two types of uh, credentials if you're playing with RFID stuff, it's a lot of fun. And they said, well, this ring has both, but I can't make it work. I don't know what's going on with it. Can you look at it? And I did. And sure enough, it, it is both, but this is a rare example of a fourth generation magic my fair just out in the consumer space. Uh, a lot of times when you see magic credentials for MyFair, kind of the Gen 1A, uh, we're not gonna get deep into the different generations of MyFair. Why, all right, quick primer if you didn't watch the long talk, which I will link below. MyFair is a credential type that's been around for a long time. NXP, NXP Semiconductor in Germany is who makes the MyFair credential. They make Desfire, they make a lot of chips. They actually make the Smart MX chip, which is in I HID's iClass CIOS product these days. The original MyFair Classic, was broken, like it was it was cracked, the implementation was figured out, had to do with the, the random number generator being weak, and then other attacks, after they fixed that, other attacks came out. There are these chips that are called Magic MyFair credentials, but they're not made by NXP. Magic MyFair is what I have in this hand. It's what a lot of us use in class when we talk about cloning hotel key cards. The thing about a MyFair credential, and maybe I'll even put the memory map up here, it is a high frequency credential, so it can, do a little more things than your basic like hid procs. It has protected memory segments. It has more power. It has more communication going on with the reader. So you can have keys to read and write different data. And the big thing though, that like part of what they treated it as secure and one of the features was like, well, there's this block zero, which is unchangeable. It's burned in at the factory. And that's like your card serial number and your various like card, you know, configuration data. So this unique identifier data is part of how like you can't just get another, let's say hotel room key. And even if you could unlock the sectors, you can't just take somebody else's PAX payload, their RFID credentialing payload, and like put it on your room key because well, your room key is gonna have a different serial number. And if the hotel's room system isn't provisioned for that serial number, well, like your key will not be accepted on your hotel door. The unchanging feature of the serial number means that a lot of systems implemented it not just as part of their security, but as all of their security. So the idea of like authentication through serial number, and again, I talked about this in my presentation, like CSN mode kind of access control, card serial number access control was thought of as like secure, but it's not. You're not accessing any protected memory segments. You're just reading the serial number of the card, which the card will give out freely to anyone. You don't have to unlock the card to get the serial number. Magic credentials 
are these, they were originally like Chinese black magic. They were, they were mostly Asian vendors coming up with these hacked, fake MyFair credentials. And in addition to being able to read and write all the different memory segments that you normally could, you could also change block zero. That includes the serial number of the card, which of course NXP did not like because now all these systems were out there that were like, oh, well, oh my God, people are cloning the credentials. You could literally make a perfect one-to-one -one copy of an actual MyFair credential, including the serial number data. Because of this security risk, a number of approaches were then implemented by the whole RFID sort of landscape. One is that newer credentials actually do try to protect the serial number. Like you can't really shield it from view when you first wake up a card, it's going to give a serial number. But like, for example, Desfire, My Fair Desfire, uh, it randomizes a serial number. So it will give a serial number as it presents itself on wake up, but it's a different one each time. So you actually have to unlock the true serial number if you're as part of the transaction. So that's one way to try to fight, you know, magic credentials. But another type, that's if you're fighting it on the sort of the credential side. Well, what about the readers and the access control systems? What some readers will do, and this, you, again, I mentioned this in the talk, not so much in the US, but you do see this in Asia. When the credential wakes up, like you present it to a reader, there is what's called the magic wake up. Like if you can try to initiate some magic commands, these backdoor commands, the credential will be like, oh yeah, I'm a Chinese magic credential. Like, what do you want to do? I'm a magic card. Readers can start doing that. It used to just be that your Proxmark or whatever tool you were using to like play with these hack credentials, it would like wake up the magic commands and like issue them. A reader can do that. And you do see the occasional reader in, in like, especially in Asian markets where you try to present a magic card. And in addition to like, yes, hi, you're a credential. What are you about? It'll like throw some magic commands at the card. And if the card does like a magic wake up, the reader, especially you see this in transit and other environments where there's stored value. That's, that's one of the popular criminal ways that these are used where you can like you, like I'm put, I'm getting on the bus now. And then it'll del like, Oh, I'm, you know, delineating, okay, you've used this much credit on your transit pass, but then it's actually not using that so you can hack it. So like the bus reader might be like, hi, oh, you're a magic credential. Why don't you F right off? And that's a problem for people who are trying to do shady things. So for that reason, magic credentials, and that's what makes this ring kind of special, come in different generations. So for the longest time, like gen one or gen one A, is what everyone had. And that's literally what's in my hand, my magic implant here. Gen one is easily detectable. It's super well known, it's widely used. So then these later generations will actually disable some of the magic commands and some of the magic wake up features. That's what was happening here. This person, they were like, look, the ring is working. Like I can see it if I, it detects that it's there but it's, it doesn't do any magic things. It doesn't say magic credential detected. Maybe this isn't a magic credential. And I was like, well, let me try a few more commands. And I was able to like, no, you got, you got something going on here. We just have to wake it up the right way. So that's what we're gonna talk about in this video here. Indeed, RFID rings. Uh, as you can see, both of them are capable of reading on our little door simulator here. Uh, I have them both enrolled in this badge system. They're a little bit tricky on that read, which is one of the first things we'll get to. Uh, if you think that you say, man, I, I just don't want to put, you know, a microchip under my skin, but I wish I had, uh, you know, credentials on me at all times. Yeah, you can, you can do that. This is a little T55 ring. The other one I've got over here, uh, this is a dual package. As I'd mentioned, this is the Magic MyFair and T55. But as, first things first, you can see, if I'm just holding it up against a reader, kind of like this, because the angle of the coils and how they mate, not coming in flat, if I come in nice and even, I can get a read. So this is just a little R10 or a little RP10 technically, smaller antenna. If you had a larger badge reader, maybe an R40 or something like a larger prox on the wall, you might be able to just kind of grab your hand over it or knock your fist into it and get a read. Getting these, to kind of get a good read on like that, it's, it's a little bit finicky. So right off the hop, be aware. If you have a smaller, you know, mini mullion style reader, just putting your hand on it like this might not be enough to make it work. So if I go ahead and put this down on my prox mark, let's do a little LF search. We should see that prox ID that I had encoded on this earlier when I was playing with it. Yeah, that works just fine. It's a standard sort of T55 style chip in there. But if we move this on over 
to the high frequency antenna, let's take a look at how it wakes up there. So sure enough, we've got a MyFair Classic. Now interesting, wait a minute. Magic commands enabled, okay. They said, okay, that's cool. It's got, it's got magic commands, that's great. So let's say we want to take a look at the data currently on this high frequency tag, the Magic MyFair. Let's do HF, MF, C view. Huh. Wait, can't get magic information. That's strange. And in fact, that is the case. They were having trouble. They said, like, it says it's a magic card, but I don't think it's working, or maybe it, they, it's fused or locked up. What my colleague did not uh, understand is that, yes, it is a magic credential, but if you saw, it shows up as a Gen 4 magic credential. And in fact, right now, magic wake up is turned off. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if you present this to a reader, it will show up like, yes, I am a MyFair credential, uh, but a lot of readers that do that sort of detection mode, like, hey, is this a magic credential? There's a chance they won't find it. And if you try to run regular basic Gen 1, you know, C load, C view, C wipe, those commands also won't interact correctly with the credential. Why? Well, magic wake up is turned off. And I had to check around in the documentation a little bit, talk to some other people. Again, big thanks to Iceman's community, uh, the people in the, you know, his Discord, etc. Really nice pointed me in the right direction. They said, hey, here's the documentation. Here's what you're looking for. Yeah, you basically can turn Magic Wake Up on and off by changing a few bits in that, that first configuration block. And I told my friend, I said, look, I don't think you have a complete piece of junk here. I think this is a genuine Magic credential. If it is in fact a Gen 4, and we can get our spot just right on the antenna there, let's try some other kind of command. So HF, MF, GDM, config. Yes. All right. We have absolutely got a magic card here. We've got a Gen 4 magic card. The problem is magic wake up was disabled. So all those scripting commands, all the other commands that you're used to using on your Proxmark, they're not going to work. The Flipper Zero, if you have it, I understand. I haven't played with it as much. I understand the Flipper Zero actually has pretty baked in support now, at least if you're running a good firmware like Momentum being able to interact with even the Gen 4, you know, magic credentials. But are we still on the antenna? We like that. All right, if we want to turn magic wake up on, and again, I'll link to all the documentation and the, the nice conversations I was having with folk. We're just going to change the first few bytes here and enter. All right, so it thinks it worked. Let's, let's check that config again to verify. Ho-ho, what do we have here? Yes, magic wake up enabled with config block access now. You can see when earlier, magic wake up style was disabled. So Gen 1 commands wouldn't work, but now they should. So if we want to go ahead and see the data on this, if we try HF, MF, C view. Oh, look at that. There we go. We've got all of our information and currently there's nothing written to the MyFair uh, sectors on this card, but we can see our data. We could interact with this. We could wipe it. We could change. Uh, you know, block zero, we could change a serial number if we wanted to do something like that. And once you've done that, in fact, let me see if I have an old payload that I dumped from a previous hotel where I was staying. So if I want to try that, let's just try an HF, MF, C load, give it a file. And I just picked one at random from a previous dump. There we go, loaded blocks onto card. And if we want to view that data now, let's take a look at whatever hotel information I had in here. We should have something up in the in a previous block seven. So yeah, all right. We've got, we've got some PAX payload data up in here. So this is, well, wherever the heck I was staying, some Marriott property somewhere. We've seen if you wanted to you know, avoid detection, you can keep that data loaded onto the card, but you could then disable magic wake up. You could turn magic wake up back off by changing that first you know, sector there. So. Let's push a new config. All right. Now let's try our, is magic wake up? Magic wake up style disabled. However, the data is still on the card. If I were to try C view or something like that, not going to be able to read it. Can't get magic block. That's, that's how, that's a, that's a basic way of interacting with gen four credentials, turning the magic wake up on or off. Now there's a lot more you can learn about it. There's a lot more you can do, but this was my first time playing with that. And I had to poke about at it a little bit, read the documentation. Huge thanks to everyone 
in the hacker community, everyone on Iceman's Discord and elsewhere who talked about this. And they said, yeah, I mean, we're documenting this more and more all the time. Indeed, those GDM commands, which I actually was asking in uh, the Discord. I said, why, why like G command? I mean, C view is Chinese load and what's G view? And so GDM apparently, it, is, it stands for like rolling code. Uh, which is some of the very poorly at this time, still poorly documented Chinese backdoor commands. Uh, the Gen 4, a lot of those are, you know, G commands as opposed to C commands. Was that fun? Did you learn something today? Uh, huge credit, by the way, in all of this goes to Eltrick and the Champ. They were two of the folk who had responded a lot to me on Iceman's Discord. And they, you know, I didn't know about how to like interact with Gen 4 magic credentials. It was not that hard. You just, again, it, the documentation is always growing. The open source community and the, the, the hacker community, they are really putting as much as they can into the various repos and the manual pages. So reach out to people, jump in the discords. Again, I'll link Iceman's discord and the uh, Biohackers Digital Discord down there. If you don't have like implants, these are not a bad way to go. In fact, this little T55 one, I'm gonna do a separate video about this. It is pretty nice. It, We'll talk about read ranges and how effectively it can read and write. Things to be aware of. It actually shipped with that famous blue cloner gun. I talked about this in my B-Sides presentation, didn't I? Uh, again, like, you'll see there's some, there's some words of wisdom and some words of caution that you should be aware of. But I think this is really neat stuff. If you want to get into this or anything else, the, again, links below, resources below. Come say hi to me elsewhere online. Come say hi to me at conferences. Come say hi, like, again, I'm, the reason this is, talk is going out a little late today, this video, I am in an airport in a few minutes and I was out late last night. I was actually seeing Adam Conover and his comedy tour. And somebody came up to me, like I was in line to like talk to Adam uh, and like somebody in line talked to me. They're like, hey, wait, are you, are you sitting right near me? Uh, nice, nice to meet you. So like, dig it. Ask me any questions about, we were talking about fire suppression systems and elevators and all kind of stuff like that. So I love that shit. If you have biohacker questions, I'll answer them or I will refer you to other smarter people with links down below who know more than me. But I hope you're doing okay. I know we're getting really close to the election. I know a lot of you might have some big feels about that. And I don't know if I'll do a separate video about that. I, I might, I might, but I've had a lot of feels and thoughts about it. It's not what this video is about, but I hope that you keep experimenting, keep playing, try to keep yourself busy. We're gonna be okay, because we're gonna have each other, we're all together. But in the meantime, never stop uh, being curious, right? Never stop learning, never stop trying, and stay safe out there.